This is The Court Leader's Advantage, a podcast series for court professionals and by court professionals. Brought to you by thecourtleader.net and in cooperation with NACOM, the National Association for Court Management. In April of 2022, we hosted a podcast called The Great Resignation. At that time, large numbers of employees were resigning, or after being furloughed for some period of time, they were deciding not to return to work. The assumption back then was that this was a temporary phenomenon. Once COVID receded, people would return to work and things would just get back to normal. Well, now it's a year and a half later. COVID is receding, or at least we think it is, yet many courts still are struggling with staffing shortages. And this is not limited to just courts. The World Bank has predicted that over the next decade, the number of people of working age in the US, that is between 15 and 65, will decline by over 3%. This is a prospect that courts will find increasingly challenging. I'm Pete Kiefer and welcome to the Court Leaders Advantage podcast series. This month, we're going to look at ongoing staffing shortages and the battle courts are having to recruit new talent. These shortages are not occurring equally around the country. Not every court is shorthanded. Not every position suffers from chronic vacancies. On the other hand, I can't think of a court administrator who hasn't told me of their struggles to find court reporters, interpreters, and IT staff. Today, we're gonna delve into several questions. Who is struggling to hire new employees? Are there specific types of employees that are more challenging to recruit? Has your court experienced operational challenges due to staff shortages? For example, increasing case backlogs, having to limit hours, or cutting back on certain types of functions. What are job candidates asking for these days regarding working conditions? And are their requests different from those of years past? And are you exploring new ways to recruit employees, such as job fairs, advertising on new websites, or using employment search agencies? Here to talk about these questions are Audrey Anger, Assistant Court Administrator for the City of Olathe, Kansas. Danielle Trujillo, Court Administrator for the Municipal Court in Littleton, Colorado. Dana Bartocci, Human Resources and Development Director for the Minnesota Judicial Branch in St. Paul, Minnesota. Miha Kapaki, Court Administrator and Probation Director for the Grays Harbor County District Court in Montesano, Washington. And Creedell Webb, Chief Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer for the 1st Judicial District in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Thank you all for joining today's podcast. Is your court struggling to recruit new employees? And are there specific types of employees that your court finds more challenging to recruit? Dana Bartocci? Sure. Um, Right now, we are starting to notice an uptick in our applicants. So we still have a ways to go to be back to pre-pandemic level, but we're not in the same struggle we were a couple years ago. Our applicant numbers are going up month over month from last December to this December. We're about 14 applicants per posting. Now we're about 25. That's generalized. Of course, there are pockets. You mentioned IT. We're still getting good candidates, but as the roles become more specialized, we see less and less applicants per post. Um, So IT is still, uh, I won't call it a struggle exactly, but doesn't have the large uh, amount of applicants as our court ops associate, that's our frontline clerk level. Also law clerks, as you mentioned, I am the HRD director for the entire state of Minnesota. We have a glut of law schools in our Twin Cities metropolitan region and not throughout the state. So we find it harder to recruit law clerks in greater Minnesota. We have more judges though, since the pandemic be open to remote or hybrid work, which has increased their applicants for greater Minnesota and rural positions. Also court reporters, um, we have some more struggle in that area as many courts have identified that especially 
demographic court reporters, they aren't graduating from school in the way they used to. So there are less uh, court reporters available for those stenographic positions, but we are you know, having some success with uh, remote and also uh, electronic reporters as well. Creedell Webb. And I'll have to agree on a number of those positions uh, for our interpreters specifically, they have to be certified. So there's already a national shortage. And then on top of that, some places have to have certified interpreters. So we do have an issue uh, recruiting for those roles. Also, I would have to agree with the court reporters. Um, I, I don't know if it's just the interest in court reporting has gone down. I know at one point we had a school here in Philadelphia for court reporting. We no longer have that. So hopefully that uh, there will be more interest in court reporting or maybe sometime in the future, the uh, technology will help assist us with this. Um, also thinking about certain IT jobs, you know, at times we can struggle with those as well as law clerks. Law clerks, sometimes you either have a lot of law clerks or either there's like there's nowhere to be found. So I'm not sure uh, why that happens, uh, but that's just something that we struggle with. So I, I find um, our challenges to be very similar. Tell me about a time when your court was particularly hamstrung looking for a new staff. Danielle Trujillo. Actually, you know, what we're finding is that people really um, don't know what court jobs look like anymore. We have to take the time in order to actually introduce them to what court jobs look like. So that way they have the opportunity to see what goes on in courts. Very few people know what a court clerk does, what a stenographer does, what the interpreters do, and what that looks like at your courthouse. So you have to really go above and beyond to show them what the opportunity is and how anybody that has a certain set of skills can come in and really um, adopt or transform into that job. I think the other thing that we've learned when you have higher level positions and you're going out to recruit for those positions, what are you doing to first look internally at your court staff to upskill them? So when we know that we're gonna have a future retirement coming um, or somebody leaves the organization, what we're doing is looking internally first and asking our current staff, is anybody even interested in this position? And what kind of education, schooling, um, training do I need to get you so that way you can be prepared for this position? And how do I help fill the position for a short amount of time to give you the opportunity to apply for that position if I need to give you some advanced training? So we're really rethinking how we're, instead of going outside first, what are we doing internally um, to help fulfill those positions and get people to know what's going on in courts? Does your court have a formal management training program for employees who show potential? Yeah, actually, we do offer a lot of leadership training within our organization. Um, we have opportunities for them uh, to get reimbursed for tuition. They also We also offer many classes internally through the city. Um, that help you get those like certified credits as well. So if you're you're taking the opportunity to take advantage of those, um, educational tracks that the city already offers, those are already noted in your profile, right? So mm -hmm. any supervisor can see that even if you don't want to stay with courts. Every year, what we do on our staff is really try to build a training curriculum for each individual and give them opportunities where they see their own growth and where I see their potential, right? Mm -hmm. So if you see that they have a certain skill set and they don't know about that job, then it's your opportunity to mentor them so they can learn, oh, here, I can go to NACOM. I can go to these classes. I can become a certified court manager, right? And you can take all these external classes that the city is willing to pay for, for you to get those certifications. So that way you have the opportunity to apply for those jobs when they become vacant. Most of the time, what we're seeing is unless you're investing in your internal people immediately, you're going to have a hard time finding perfect matches. Invest in the people that you already have that you know that are a fit for your organization and help them grow. Because a lot of times those front level clerks aren't coming in with college degrees, right? But we can help them get there over a couple of years time to get associate's degrees, to get the training that they need in order to continue to grow within the organization. They'll be more loyal. Um, and we know that their productivity is gonna go up because they see growth within our organization. 
The other mm -hmm. opportunity that we offer is we actually partner with local school districts in order to provide high school internships. And when those high schoolers come in, they spend an entire semester with us and we teach them how to be court clerks because they're interested in the legal field. And we've had two high school interns every semester for the last uh, three years. And those interns have done an amazing job. At the end of that internship, what we do is we actually put a job posting in front of them for something that's open in uh, the local metropolitan area and ask them to see what they know. And if they can check off that they have all of that skill set in order to apply for any court clerk job here in Colorado, not just at our courthouse, we make sure that we help them with their resume so they can properly put down the skills that they learned at our courthouse. We want them to know that when they graduate high school, that they have an opportunity to go straight into a great career path in courts, if that's what they want to do. Audrey Anger? We didn't have the issue during COVID that a lot of people had with the great resignation. So we kind of all stuck together and hunkered down. We have a small kind of group of people. It's only 12 people. But here recently, um, once things have loosened up after COVID and opportunities have arose, it seems like we've had our own kind of great resignation of people moving on to other opportunities and other fields, you know, ready to make that that change in their career path that they weren't really necessarily confident in making during COVID when things were not as stable. So that's what we're running into now. And it's it's posed a problem within our our unique group of people just because it seemed it's confusing. And so the remaining staff is is questioning what we're doing. And um with regard to what um Danielle was talking about, um explaining what the position is, we we too um took upon in this hiring process this time um, to better explain uh, what the role of the job was and what it looked like and what the day-to-day -day looked like. And I guess my question um, for Danielle would possibly be, have you ever run into where that potentially backfired? Um, because some people kind of seemed as though it was a little more than they anticipated for, you know, the pay that was being offered. So just curious if maybe you had ever run into that. So I think what we've learned is uh, we have, have the opportunity to kind of do temp positions within the city, especially for somebody internal. So that way they can really see if it's a fit for them and give them an opportunity to do that over a, a significant period of time, let's say two to four months or six months. Um, so we can put them in a temp role so they can see what those job functions look like and what the day to day really feels like. Um, without ever abandoning their other job, right? And that's a huge piece because they're like, oh, what happens if I don't like it? And so you definitely, we've learned that allowing them to try it out works really good. I think the other thing is as a supervisor, right? Or a court administrator, you're also seeing if they can rise to the challenge, right? Before mm -hmm. they formally interviewed for this job. So twofold, it works to everybody's advantage to see if this person is really a good fit for this role and if they really like it. Has your court had to cut back on any services due to staff shortages? Miha Kapaki? Aloha, Peter. Mahalo for having us. Um, so this is something that we are dealing with on a constant basis. I am in a very rural part of Washington State. We have a very high, we, we, have, we have a lot of um, citations in our district court and uh, not a lot of staff. And what ultimately happens is my staff is overburdened and overloaded with a, a massive caseload. Some options that the county has tossed out to us this year, actually, they're in the planning process. So one of these may still pass is every Friday would be a half day. So everyone would clock out at lunch and and we all just take a few hours of a cut to our, our normal week. Another option they have thrown out was allowing employees to reduce their hours voluntarily uh, without using any paid time off. And so um, that's an option there. And then another option that they're considering is early retirement. So we are, um, 
experiencing, I feel, um, massive caseloads, not enough staff. And the answer seems to be, well, let's let's just maybe cut back a little bit and, and try to do less, which is very hard to do in our line of work. Audrey? Um, we haven't really had to cut back, I I'll say yet, um, but we have let in we have let things go more so than we have, you know, records requests might take another couple of days versus, you know, a day turnaround. Um, people might have to wait in line a little longer. We've kind of created a culture of spoiling people to an extent, you know, very fast, very efficient. Um, and we also too have gotten used to that being able to provide that. Um, so it's also kind of a mindset change for us and allowing ourselves to take a break and just say, hey, you know, we know it's there. We're we're prioritizing. We are handling what needs to be done on that day. And the rest of it will be here the next day whenever we come back. Have you noticed any change lately in what prospective job candidates are asking for in terms of working conditions? Miha? Yes, I think a very common one that we might be seeing is requests to tele telework, work from home, uh, flexing their schedules. That's one uh, that we hear a lot. And we do accommodate some kind of flexing, but the, any kind of a permanent schedule, we just can't really do that at this time. But I think those are our top two in my county. Danielle? I have the same uh, asks, obviously, but I think what we've tried to do is really take a standpoint that we can. And so we've positioned ourselves to be an employer um, just like anybody else, right? If you wanted to compete with Google or um, with Apple, if you wanted to compete with the tech world or you want to compete with other cities, then you have to be an employer who's actually taking care of their employees, they, many young people have opportunities everywhere. So why would they choose to be a public servant if we're not actually taking care of our employees? So we actually, this year, uh, re we reduced our ability to be open five days a week to four days a week. So we actually closed the courthouse on Fridays to create more flexibility for our employees. We also know that our employees face really harsh conditions in the environment that they're in, right? People come into the courthouse really upset, angry, distraught, frustrated, and tend to take it out on our frontline staff. And so we do a really good job of making sure that we offer them a lot of flexibility in their schedule and that we rotate when they have to be in front at the counter and when they get some time to work without having to deal with customers. And that's actually been really good for their mental health, um, and then feeling as though they're able to be productive and get their work done because they have some downtime where they're not having to answer phones or having to deal with constant disruption of people coming up to the counter. And that's huge for them. The other thing, having remote work, you know, judges, lawyers, um, your frontline staff should be able to all work from home. We all have the opportunity to tap into new innovation and new technology um, that cities should be offering or that courthouses should be offering, right? Many cities are still trying to get to that point, but it shouldn't be without a push. Every courthouse should make it accessible to everybody wherever they're at, including their employees. So for us, those are the minor things to do. Our biggest thing is work culture and making sure that we have a positive environment for our employees to be in, that they walk in every day and that they love their job and they feel appreciated and valued and that they're contributing in a really positive way to the community. And when you focus on some of those little things, um, people will stick around. They'll want to work with you. You'll have no problem filling new positions because they can see they have amazing work-life balance and that the benefits there are going to completely outweigh anywhere else. What measures, if any, has your court put in place to recruit new employees? And are there any plans in the works to reach out in new areas? Dana? All right. We have more than double the career fairs um, that we've attended, and they're starting to be back in person, which, as Credell said, you know, it's kind of fun to talk to people. And we're seeing more and more people come to those career fairs. But we also still have the benefit of remote career fairs that we didn't really have before. 
our court has started an every Friday uh, walk-in, drop-in career fair um, through LinkedIn that folks can just drop in and we've got applications from those drop-in career fairs. Because as we were talking about, people don't often know uh, about what jobs are offered at the courts. And so if somebody has some questions, they can stop in, they can ask about it. And it really hasn't been that much time or money to set these up because it's virtual and, and we've got them set up. And if nobody shows up, that's okay. But we also have had some great conversations with people. The other thing that we've started doing is something that the, uh, the corporate world has been doing for a long time. I, I don't wanna say stalking LinkedIn um, because there's actual modules you can purchase that aren't that expensive where you can look for folks who uh, might meet your requirements and knock on their door virtually. And we've been doing more of that as that technology has become easier and cheaper uh, for our HR staff to do is to look and actively shoot someone an email saying, hey, your skills match this you know, cybersecurity job. Are you interested in talking? So we've done a lot more of that for some specialized roles and we've had some great success with that too. We've also, rather than just sharing our jobs with colleges and universities on their handshake platform or whatever platform they're using, is actively maybe reaching out to the director of their academic program saying, hey, do you know anybody? Or reaching out directly to their affinity and, and diversity bar groups for our uh, law clerks and look at those groups in law schools and in undergrad and reach out directly to the student organizers rather than just posting it in one place. So we've become a little bit more active in what we're doing to do this. You know, you used to be, can you post it in a paper? We don't have that anymore. So mm -hmm. what are we doing instead? Cridell? Yes, yeah, so we post on our court's website, which uses uh, Cyber Recruiter, but we also use the city of Philadelphia. So they have a system called Smart Recruiter. And what that does is it not only posts the job on the city of Philadelphia's website, but it also gets posted on 26 other sites such as Glassdoor, you know, um, career jet about jobs. There's a, a lot of jobs. So that way we're reaching a wider group of individuals, a wider applicant pool. I do agree with Dana that um, when you look at certain affinity groups or law schools or, or, or ways to partner, that's another good way of getting uh, employees. If you offer some sort of internship. So we partner with Drexel here. We have an internship for law students. And hopefully after those internships, they may want to come back for an actual clerkship and it'll give them an opportunity to come into our courthouses, network, uh, learn a bit about what we do. I think another thing is we have to think about what barriers we may have that may prevent people from working at our courts. So we used to have a residency requirement where you had to live in Philadelphia, PA. It was eventually dropped uh, I don't think that recruiting was the only consideration. I'm sure there were other considerations, but that also helps, you know, knowing that you can recruit from people that may live outside a county. I'm going to add on to one thing Credell said is those barriers and looking at what those barriers are. A few years ago, we removed our uh, education requirement from the majority of our job and allow substitute of experience. And that really opens the jobs to a lot more people to be able to apply. The only jobs right now are our law clerks that require a JD, our forensic psychologists, things that truly require um, a higher education degree. But this has allowed more people to apply and those barriers have been removed, or at least we try to help them be removed. We've also removed some barriers regarding you know, in-person interviews. If someone has another job, they might be able to just do a Zoom interview quickly, not for mm -hmm. all of our jobs, but requiring people to come down to a courthouse for an interview might, it, somebody who's working two jobs, they may not be able to take a day off mm -hmm. to do that. So how are we opening that? As well as reducing the amount of questions we ask on applications. When we looked at our statistics, we got far more applications with less questions, uh, KSA kind of questions at uh, the end of the application. And they are still just as qualified. But once again, if somebody's working, you know, a full-time job, they may not have time to do that. And really reframing that 
as a good thing, not well, if they really wanted this job, they'd fill out these questions, you know, trying to reframe that to say, don't we want someone who's a good employer for someone else too, and give them time. And we can, through an interview process or other things, get to those questions. But how do we get, you know, a broader spectrum of applicants is really looking at what barriers we were putting up and how we can get a, a better and more diverse candidate group. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to piggyback a little bit on that because I think there's a myth out there that when you're dropping a, re a degree requirement, you're lowering a standard. And that's not true. We're now living in a day and age where you can obtain different certifications. Knowledge, skills, and abilities are available uh, to you can increase those online by different free college courses. You don't necessarily need a four year degree for those types of jobs. So I don't like to say that it's a lowering of a standard. What we like to say is we're removing those barriers. And I think we need to know what is a real standard. Like if you need an attorney, if you need a doctor, okay, they have to be licensed. Um, or if you need a certified human resources professional, okay, they have to be certified. But if there's a job that doesn't require that degree, let's look at the knowledge, skills, and abilities that these individuals are bringing and not just make something and call it a standard when it really is an illusory standard and it's more so a barrier. So I, I really appreciate all those points that you made. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Danielle? Yeah, I was going to uh, say that what we've learned too is when you put all the onus on HR to say, hey, we need a new position filled and you say, go fill it. That's really tough for HR to do. But when you own that and you say, hey, we have a new position here and you put that out to your staff and your entire team and say, look, what are we looking for? If you know somebody, go out and talk about the position. Talk about how much you love working here. Talk about what you do in your community. Talk about that with your groups of friends. Somebody's kid needs a job. Somebody just graduated college, right? All these 10 people will be like, what? You have an opening? Yeah. Here's what the job looks like. Go out and do the recruiting yourself, right? You're the best salesperson of what that job is going to look like. And you're the one who's actually going to go out and actually get to talk to people about what they can do and what the opportunity has to offer for them. And they'll be able to ask you those questions. Don't be afraid of going out and doing the recruiting yourself. And finally, what advice do you have for courts that are struggling to recruit new talent? Miha? As someone that was young and I had the seed planted, uh, in civics when I was in seventh grade, never knew I was going to go into this field because I was destined to be a rock star. I was really surprised that the little bits of, of knowledge that I learned at a young age really stuck with me. And I really, it just, it was my future. So for me, I love the idea of kind of tapping into this new generation alpha, like Fidel was talking about the ages two to 13, our iPad babies. And uh, for the first time ever, our court in May is participating in law day where we're inviting fifth graders in all the neighboring schools to come and visit our court. You know, we, they, they can come and visit us. We'll have the, the stakeholders are all there. We have prosecutors to come and see what our prosecutors do, our defenders, our law enforcement. It's so much more than just, you know, a judge and attorney come and see what our clerk does, come and see what we do back here behind the scenes. And we're so excited about it. Never done anything like that before, but if we can just plant one seed in one little mind, hopefully someday that will grow and we can um, inspire our future generation. Audrey? I love that, Miha. Um, we too are doing some stuff with the high school civics kids. Um, they have an internship day and I've been trying to work with their um, education program that they have at the high school to get something going up um, regularly, not just a day thing. Other than that, um, I really do believe that um, me personally, I've seen a huge culture shift in the courts um, with a lot of things um, since COVID. Um, and I think the biggest trending kind of, if we had to coin a, a, a term, it would be open-minded, you know, um, because I've the problems that come up for me are when people are not being open-minded or I'm not being open-minded. Um, things seem to, we find a solution for stuff and we find something that works. And honestly, sometimes it works a lot better than what we had before. Whenever we all come to the table and we're just 
willing to throw it all out there and see what we get um, and weed through it all, not eliminate anything or automatically say, hey, that's not going to work or we can't do this or, you know, OK, well, let's think about it. Could we? You know, why don't we? Um, and that kind of thing, because I've seen a lot of good stuff come from that whenever the people that get around the table are all open minded and just genuinely want to fix or find a solution that is for the betterment of everybody. Dana? We have an amazing mission as the courts. The beginning of our mission statement in Minnesota is to provide justice, and then it goes on to a whole bunch of other things. But leaning into what we do, we are an innovative and exciting branch of government, and getting that culture out in front of people is really important. So leaning more into what you get to do every day in the courts is that way of helping to recruit, focus on your culture. We heard your, Danielle talk about the, the culture she's built there. It's not exactly about, you know, moving a, a piece of paper from A to B. It's, it's really providing justice and serving the people of wherever you are. So leaning into that mission with recruiting is really important um, as we look at this. Also, don't be afraid of social media or any media on, on showing what we do. Media or media strategy or social media strategy doesn't have to be, oh, we're just posting a job at LinkedIn on LinkedIn. It's also all the cool stuff, whether it's, you know, do you have a wedding day? Do you have an adoption day? All the cool stuff that we do in courts um, that people get to be a part of. So I think the kind of innovative thing that you can do if you're struggling is think about how you brand your court as an employer and then live that brand as well. Cridell? Yes, I would say let's consider our job application process when we're looking at our job postings. So let's make sure that they're accurate so that the job duties and responsibilities that an applicant looks at are the actual job duties and responsibilities that they have when they come into our courts. We want to make sure that we're using inclusive language. We don't want to use language that discourages any particular demographic, whether that's a person of a certain age or uh, gender or things like disabilities. We need to communicate. When we have an application process and someone submits an application, we should respond, hey, your application has been received. A lot of candidates will complain if you make them submit letters of recommendation and a cover letter, your resume, and they're putting all this out there for you, all to get nothing back. So I think we really need to communicate. Even if these are uh, applicants that are not good for us right now, we may need them in the future. So we have to think about our reputation. And so if we can make our application process as smooth as possible, I think that's helpful, whether that's helpful immediately or helpful uh, in the future, because that goes to our reputation. And when we look at it, we think about our reputation, that's directly linked to the public trust and confidence, even if, when it comes to jobs. Danielle? Yeah, I love that you brought in uh, the inclusive as aspect of when you're posting jobs, is your envi your work environment actually inclusive? And are you prepared to help somebody with disabilities take on a job in your workforce? Um, have you looked at all of those avenues at your courthouse to make sure that you can do that and meet the needs of any employee? Um, I, one other cool thing that we do is take your child to work day. Uh, and so just like you talked about law day and encouraging uh, people in your community to come and bring their child to your courthouse, um, doing little things like that can make a huge difference for people to see what the courthouse actually looks like. Um, the other piece would be um, when you're actually going out and hiring people and you're talking with them, right? When we when COVID happened and everybody asked me what I did for my job, I really took that aim of, well, you know, there's people out and there's a huge social justice movement right now about the transformation of courts. And so I'm not out protesting, but I'm living that work every day at my courthouse. I'm stepping into the future. And when any time a vacancy comes open in my courthouse, what I do is reevaluate, how do I want that position to be future ready, right? I'm not trying to fill the position for today. I'm trying to keep that position for five years from now. So if I need to adjust some language in there so it gets me to be future ready, then that's what I'm gonna do. And so I'm gonna reestablish what these positions look like as we move along into the future. So that way I can have the courthouse that I want in 10 years from now. I want to thank Audrey Anger, Danielle Trujillo, Mihawk Apaki, Donna Portochi, 
and Credel Webb for their experiences and strategies for courts dealing with chronic staff shortages. Many courts around the country are struggling. Sharing ideas on how to cope with being shorthanded is an important step. As always, my thanks to you court professionals tuning into today's episode. Even when you're working shorthanded and covering multiple desks, you approach your work with calm and expert skill. Thank you for all you do. Join us on Tuesday, April 16th, for another episode dealing with the issues facing our courts. This has been the Court Leaders Advantage podcast series. I'm Pete Kiefer, and thanks for joining us today. Thanks for joining us today. The Court Leaders Advantage is a regular podcast on courts and court administration. Today's episode will be available on our website, on YouTube, on Facebook, on iTunes, on LinkedIn, and on Twitter. Become part of the conversation. If you have questions, comments, or ideas for future episodes, email us. Our address is podcast. that's all one word, at nakamnet.org. Did you hear an interesting comment by one of the panelists that you would like to listen to again, but you don't want to search through the entire episode to find it? The additional resources section of the webpage contains a question time marker sheet. Just find the discussion question on the sheet, and next to it is the time that question was asked. You can then quickly fast forward to that time in the episode and listen to the panelists' comments. Remember, if you don't have time to watch an episode, you can always listen to the audio version. Listen in your car or on the bus on your way to or from work. You never have to miss an episode. I'm Pete Kiefer, and on behalf of our guests, the Court Leader website, and the National Association for Court Management, thank you, and have a great day. The views, information, and opinions expressed during this episode are solely those of the host and the individual presenters. They do not necessarily represent the position of the National Association for Court Management.